<laughs> so um, when you were studying anthropology and then also later teaching it, did you find that you had a specific focus area? Psychology and a different way to look at it all Cause my perspective is broken um, Was there a particular type of anthropology you gravitated towards or was it just anthropology in general or what yeah. would you say your focus area was? I, I've had, I, it's, it's kind of a, a long story but I try to brief, make it brief -ish. but my initial interest was just as a teenager, I was interested in the fact that you could dig stuff up and, and learn about things. So I became interested, as I developed more of an academic orientation, looking at historic archaeology, I became interested in a huge transformation that happened in, in globally when we went from a, a, when Western society went from basically isolated villages, farms, a little bit of trade, to something much more. Where, so it's for the point where if you had some milk, in a in your kitchen it would be in a pot that you made or someone down the street made versus something made in leeds england and put on a ship right okay like what, what i was interested in how the material culture that underlied what we all did became industrialized and and uh uh universalized so that objects so that instead of so that that the making and maintenance of objects became was taken out of individual or even outside the village or outside the city or town and became an, an international thing because that is associated and that's associated with the transformation that happened in the 18th century up through the civil war let's say so especially interested in that period but i was working in contract work meaning going and doing archaeology that you have to do before a building is built or a sewer is installed to rescue sites or avoid damaging archaeological sites and the company that the the it was an institution at harvard it Harvard University realized it had a company working within it that was that was uh, doing basically commercial work for about a million dollars a year, mostly under contract with the state who were building roads. And they realized it had nothing to do with academics, it had nothing to do with students or faculty. So they just said, well, there are about 10 organizations here that are doing consulting work. We're going to kick them all out. Mm. So the place I was going to work was going to be kicked out and I was to find work elsewhere. And while I was while that was happening, I took a class from David Pilbeam, who is a biological anthropologist at Harvard. It was like a summer school class. And I realized I want to study human evolution. Mm -hmm. that's, what the, that's what the class was. Mm -hmm. It was kind of interesting because since the, the TAs in the class had seen me around for, for years, because I had been working in the same building they were working in, they assumed I was a graduate student, a perennial graduate student who had been there forever. But that was the first and only class I'd ever taken in their subject. So we were writing essays each week short ones and i'd hand it in and it would come back covered with red like don't you know this don't you know that and finally we i you know was, was talking to them at a beer hour which was an, uh, a weekly uh, tradition in, in the peabody museum and they said wait you're not a graduate student we just assumed you were a graduate student who hadn't really studied anything in our field <laughs> because i'd been around all that time mm -hmm. so anyway I, I got interested in that and um it's funny how I, I, I think I had a very early on a pragmatic understanding of what you would study. And this is something I advise students about is you might have an ideal of what thing you want to study. And then you're going to do whatever you have to do to make sure that you can study that. And if you are successful, you'll be one of those stories like Jane Goodall or someone who always wanted to study something. The truth is Jane Goodall always wanted to study wild dogs. She ended up stuck with the chimps, but then she liked it after a while. Okay. Um, what really happens? I was going to say that's not what the movie said. Right. I know. Uh, uh, the uh, it, what really happens is opportunities come along, and you balance and negotiate your interests and the opportunities that come along. So I was teaching, uh, being a teaching assistant as a graduate student there, and uh, looking at possible projects to work on. My advisor at that point was Glenn Isaac, who was the Africanist archaeologist working in. Kenya mostly, uh, with Richard Leakey on the Kubi Four project, and um, Irv Devore, who was a sort of father of modern primatology in America, pulled me over again. It was beer hour, I think, where all important things happen, and he pulled me aside really? and said, um, "It, it was—I've never told the story before. There was another guy who was an archaeologist in this program, so we we're both archaeologists, and he said." Tell me why John should not go to the Aturi forest and do archaeology of the F.A. Pygmies. 
instead of you. Mm. And I had never heard of this, you know, opportunity. So I, I basically said, I'm not going to tell you why John shouldn't do it. He probably should do it. He's more into certain things than I am. And maybe he'd be really good at it, but I would be good at it too. I think anyway, that turned out to be DeVore's way of telling me that I was going to be doing my thesis on in the Congo <laughs> if I wanted to. And by the end of the day, I decided to do it. So it was an opportunity that I hadn't seen coming. I thought I was going to be working in East Africa on Homo erectus. And it turned out I did work on some of those related, th related things later, but I got the opportunity to go and, and work with and live with the F.A. Pygmies and the Lesse villagers in the Aturi forest. And I spent more than half the time over about a four or five year period living there coming back and doing like one semester of graduate work and then going back to the Ethereum forest and back and forth because of that conversation. Do I detect a hint of jealousy in your facial expression, Josh? <laughs> I saw that. No. Everybody <laughs> wants to do that. But here's the thing. It's a really interesting thing to do. And a lot of, I, not many people have done it. Not many people worked on that project, but it was a project that was already underway for about five years when I went out. And a lot of people had already worked on it. And the rule was no more than a few researchers at a time at the research site. So people, would, and you had to commit to staying there for many, many months. Mm -hmm. So you'd come in and overlap for a few weeks with the people that were there. Then you'd stay there. You, maybe you were there with two or three people. And then you would leave and overlap with the people coming in. And almost everybody who went there, I, I grew up, I grew up with, with camping. My parents were always taking me out in the woods and like leaving me there. So the idea of living in a forest on my own was not anything new to me. The idea of having wet feet all the time was never a problem for me. Um, but Can almost every, <laughs> well, yeah, see, for, it is for a lot of people. Almost everybody who went out there intended to study the F.A., who are the pygmies that live in the forest, and ended up studying the Lesse, who are the people that live in these slightly more dry villages where you have a house with a roof on it. Um, and... Uh, because it, it, because when you go out of the forest to the pygmies, it is extremely uncomfortable coming from a Western setting. Mm -hmm. And really, in two weeks, you grow accustomed to it. Two or three wow. weeks, you grow, you grow accustomed to it. You grow accustomed mm -hmm. to anything in a few weeks, right? There's no like you can't leave. There's no alternative. Yeah, like you might you might not grow accustomed to something you can walk away from any time. But if you can't walk away from it, right. it's just you know. So I ended up doing that, and. Um, so that was so my interest, my focus of study had always been how people use the land, how people distribute themselves across the land. And so I studied how the F.A. Pygmy men use the landscape, how they um, when they were doing all the various different things they do, like wh why do they put their camps where they put them and their other activities. As a rule in that society, male anthropologists can work with male local people. And female archaeologists, anthropologists can work with the women. It's kind of a sex division that's built into the culture. Hmm. So okay. I focused on I, I was going to say, is that a rule imposed by the school or by the actual people? It, it's, that a, you're... it's a rule imposed by the extremely high anxiety among the men who okay. live there because it's a hypergenous society. Okay. So an F.A. pygmy man cannot have a relationship or marry a villager woman. But a villager man can have a relationship with and marry even as a second wife or third wife a pygmy woman so right. pygmy women are are regularly siphoned off the society so there's a shortage of women relative to men uh so the men and the men can't do anything about that it's part of the whole society they can't do anything about it so they just don't need some other men coming along and adding to it and so there's a bit of a fear about the relation to that. It's just, is it a matri Is it a patriarchal society? The villager society is, you know, if you look at the kinship system. I know this society, is in our discussion, but no, I'm, well, just, it I'm really, so fascinated. It, it by then that story. Gonna, we're going to we're going to circle back to all this. I'm sure. The uh, yeah, the uh, it, it, the kinship system is a, is a patriarch patrilineal system, but among the villagers, is more patri patriarchal. Really means men are in charge. Mm -hmm. hmm. And in the, in the villagers, the men are more in charge than the women. But among the the hunter-gatherers, the F.A. pygmies, it's really much more even. And so one of the most important kind of decisions they have to make is where are they going to put their camp? Where are you going to live for the next few weeks? And, and, and that choice involves getting everything together and moving a distance. And 
where you are determines the opportunities for both the women and the men. The women like to work in gardens to exchange their labor for food. And the men like to hunt for honey and game. The men also like to work in gardens during a certain month of the year because they can get jobs cutting down trees for villagers in exchange for tobacco and marijuana. So who wants to be where? Sometimes everybody wants to be the, a certain place, so everybody agrees. But sometimes the women want to be one place and the men want to be a different place, so they then have a disagreement. And as one sex needs to be somewhere more, that's where they go. Mm-hmm. And when the other sex needs to be somewhere else more, that's where they go. So it's a, it's a negotiation. So it works out, it sounds like. It works out, and it's a pretty even negotiation. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be that even if it was a patriarchal group, right? The men would always right. go where they wanted to. So, um, the, so it's it's much more egalitarian among the hunter gatherers. Okay, I have three simple questions for you, and then I'm going to ask you a question that directly leads into our main discussion. Okay. The first question is: When the men are hunting for honey, mm-hmm. are they doing it by themselves, or are they cooperating with other local animals? Oh, with other animals? Yeah, sure. Uh, they uh they are using honey guides sometimes which, which is, is a bird, bird right yep mm-hmm. and the honey guide of course it trains badgers honey badgers to uh to go after the honey so that when the badger is ripping apart the nest the honey guides come in and eat the the, the honey that gets loose but most of the time they find the nest on their own they wander around they don't wander around they have specific trails that they walk on <laughs> Okay, but it looks like they're wandering, but they're actually very specifically going to spooky places and they're listening and they can hear the bees. So they start noticing where the trees, what trees are getting occupied by bees and how busy the bees are. And when they start to figure out a certain tree has a likelihood of having honey, they'll mark the tree. And then when it's time, they'll go off that tree and sometimes they'll sample it and say not ready yet. Other times they'll go and exploit the honey right away. Um, So they'll use honey guides to find those trees. Mm-hmm. But usually they find them without the honey guys because often it's a tree they've already gotten the honey from. Gotcha. I just think that that's so fascinating, the symbiotic relationship yeah. between the honey guides and the honey badgers and people and just showing people that, you know, yeah, in other societies, animals and humans are working together and they're, you know, for the collective of all of the different species. So that's just yeah. so fascinating to me.